very glad to be here. And I have friends who are Berbers, Muslim, and uh, Sinhalese, but I've never met Tamil, uh, Tamil uh, Namkans. So I'm very happy to be here. And uh, there's a lot of killings that happened all over the world. Uh, in China, in Nanjing, uh, First World War, Second World War, in the Ukraine, in Europe, uh, in West Germany, Poland, Czech Republic, as you call it now, uh, and all over Western Europe. And then more recently in Bosnia, and then in Africa we have uh, Darfur and Rwanda. And in Southeast Asia we had Cambodia. And then also um, during the First World War in, uh, among the Armenians in Turkey. So things have happened. People have been killing other people uh, just because they belong to one other ethnic group. And the same thing happened in Sri Lanka. And some people have been killed because of their political beliefs in Argentina, Chile, and Palestine. So because of that, the, the United Nations was formed after the First World War, Second World War, uh, there was just barbarity, people killing pe people of other religion and other ethnicity, and decided we should formalize and have what we call as human rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So everyone, everyone, everyone on earth, each and every person, whatever your faith, uh, your ethnicity, color, gender, has human rights. And there are two things you can do to uh, work for human rights. The first thing is called protection, very urgent, and the second is called promotion. Uh, some issues are, we already mentioned everyone has a right, literally everyone. But if there is armed conflict, some people are supposed to be protected at all times, especially if they're not uh, in, uh, engaged in armed conflict especially women and children. I've seen videos, uh, uh, Skanta had uh, given us some links on videos of what happened, and brave people who took pictures and videos from their cell phones, posted them on YouTube, they're just horrible. I've heard about the violence that took place, but I've never seen actual videos, so it was very brave of the people who actually took them and posted them and let other people know what's going on. And there was also, I think, a famous female journalist uh, who was also just, they did horrible things to her, uh, br br brutally. And then violence against marginalized communities, the minorities. And then the, the government actually being involved in, in violence, killing of people. So many things are to be discussed including justice, and maybe can, what's the role of religion? Is there something we can do? And then the important letter that was just read for my session, what about sustainable development for the local community, the poorest of the poor? And can we as individuals do something? Uh, or do we feel we're too hopeless, we're too far away, we can only send money, but Skanta is trying to raise the question, there are other things we can do aside from just sending money. Okay. First thing, there are two things, is to protect human rights. Uh, we, it's a reaction to something that has already happened. If an abuse has already taken place, we need to protect human rights. Uh, um, and then promotion is the other side of the coin of human rights, is before any abuse happens, we have to be proactive. Do something to avoid violations from happening ever again. I've mentioned the barbarity that had taken place during the First World War, Second World War, and right now, uh, aside from the two major world wars, there were local wars uh, within countries. Aside from Sri Lanka, you have in the Philippines, you, you had in Cambodia, you had in Rwanda, Somalia, and Colombia up to today, and, and so on and so forth in many parts of the world. So that's the reality today. This graph simply says, even, even if there's civil war going on, you cannot violate 
certain rights of people. That's the minimum protection. Uh, they're protected under the laws of war, the Geneva Conventions. Uh, there are four Geneva Conventions and two additional protocols. It says in general you cannot just kill people just because you think uh, they did something wrong. Just arbitrarily killing. You cannot torture people just because you think they did something wrong against the government. Even if there's armed conflict, people still have the rights to be protected. And only people who are armed combatants can fight combatants. But civilians, especially women and children, uh, should be protected at all times. That's the minimum standard. So whether there is war, there's the full blown protection of humanitarian law, or there's no war, the full protection of human rights. But you cannot go beyond certain minimum standards. There's no excuse for killing people just because uh, those people do not believe in what the government says, including if people want to create a second state, uh, if they say it, it's not uh, constitutionally, I think, in any part of the world, illegal to speak out against the government. Of course, there are limits. If we use force, it's another question. Then humanitarian law comes into play. In peacetime, you have the government, the police, dealing with the civilians. The human rights are in full effect. And two major organizations to which we can report violations, uh, you've heard of them already, are Amnesty International, uh, and secondly, Human Rights Watch. There are many others, but they are the major ones, and they play a very important role in publicizing information. In fact, uh, you must have heard of Chile, the former dictator Pinochet, when he traveled to Spain, what Amnesty did was to talk with governments including the government of Spain and say, do you know that Pinochet, Augusto Pinochet, had killed many people under his command, uh, under the dictatorship? So when he comes to Spain, could you please arrest him? And so that we can bring him to court? The Spanish government said yes. So we think it's impossible to keep on talking about human rights. We need patience and a lot of work. It was possible. They, they arrested him when he went to Spain and brought him to court, uh, but he died. Uh, and then Amnesty International also talked with many governments, including Canada, and they said, if the former president of the US who had uh, engaged war in the Middle East, if he goes to Canada, could you arrest him? Because there were many things which were done illegally. The Canadian government did not agree. So it's not easy. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. But it doesn't hurt trying. United Nations, we've seen the report uh, uh, on the video. Uh, you have a uh, known uh, doctor, he's got a doctoral degree, who went to the UN to talk about death in the family. Of course, results may not come out uh, as we wish, but it's worth publicizing the, the information. The United Nations has many, 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 many bodies to which you can send report. This will call for another session. I will not talk about them. Some of them are based on the Charter of the United Nations, and there are different procedures to file complaints. And if you're interested, I have friends both who are with the non-governmental organization, both in Geneva and in New York, who would give you time if they think your case is very important to talk before the UN. There are, you have to be an international non-governmental organization to be able to speak before the UN. They might give you seven minutes maximum. It's worth flying uh, a survivor or a, a, a family member of somebody who had been killed, like what we saw in the video, to talk before the UN, to publicize the information that people know about it. So in Geneva, Switzerland, and also in New York, depending on where they meet. And then there are other bodies, 10 more bodies, that deal with human rights inside the UN. There are many other mechanisms. Sure, governments uh, can pressure and say no, but it doesn't hurt to try to bring the issue out. Okay. When there is uh, armed conflict going on within the country, there's still protection uh, provided. For example, soldiers and rebels should be bound by the same laws of war. I think, I don't know to what extent it is working very well. 
in the Philippines, non-governmental organizations uh, talk to non-governmental organization people and tell them, look, these are the laws of war. Whether you're rebel or you're soldier, you have to obey these rules. And soon later, both the rebels and the soldiers heard about this, and they wanted to learn about the laws of war and also of uh, how both the soldiers and the rebels should be bound by them. And there are some mechanisms out and government and the rebels sign these documents and then you need an outside power like the International Committee of the Red Cross to, to do this. So when somebody is wounded or sick, including uh, soldiers and rebels, not just civilians, they are protected under international law. Uh, for instance, since I've been talking with the, the International Committee of the Red Cross, they, they are Swiss, they're not the National Red Cross. It's different, the one in Geneva. They don't deal with disaster, they deal with war. They would say that one rebel was put inside the tent under the sun uh, as a form of torture. And then the ICRC, the Red Cross found out from Switzerland, and they, they talked with the military, they said, that's illegal under international law of war. You should not do that. And the military took out the, the rebel who was put inside the tank. And then another case where the rebel uh, captured a soldier uh, who was wounded. The rebels called for the International Committee of the Red Cross who have captured a wounded Philippine government soldier. Do you want to take them out and bring to a hospital? And the Red Cross, the International Red Cross, not the local Red Cross, not the U.S. Red Cross. The International Committee of the Red Cross said, okay, we're going there. We'll make sure we give safe passage for the rebel, I'm sorry, for the soldier to get out of the rebel territory to go to a hospital. Things can be done. You need an outside body too. The difference between Amnesty International, uh, Human Rights Watch on the one hand is they rely on publicity and shame and you know, lot, lots of talk. Red, International Committee of the Red Cross does it quietly, confidentially. They do behind the scenes. We need both. Uh, each one does one thing good. And Red Cross does one thing, and Amnesty does another. And if you combine, the situation might work. Uh, so uh, the International Committee of Red Cross deals with war. I was very shocked to find out as, er, as late as May 1, Amnesty International said there are no human rights in Sri Lanka. Like, oh my, I thought, you know, the, the war ended, there should be, you know, truth and reconciliation, like, and then Human Rights Watch said, there's no progress four years on. Uh, these are noted uh, groups. Uh, they won a Nobel Prize for Peace, saying th things have not really changed for the better. So, uh, th there are two things which can be done. Education is so important. When some things happen, if we know of relatives or friends or uh, activists or journalists or who disappear, what we do is together we bring a group of people. You want to bring people who are famous in the country or who have doctorate degrees because the government will somehow respect them to a certain degree and say habeas corpus. Like, where is this person? That person has disappeared. We want to know where this person is. Okay, it happened many times when uh, you know, a priest disappeared uh, who was working on human rights in the Philippines. We all gathered people and say, let's go to the police station, to the military camp, and say, where, what happened to this person? What, where is he? And finally, they brought out the priest. And then others, we did a little too late, they said the first day is very important. If we didn't find the person the first few hours, torture could happen. If you leave them for a few days, they could be killed. So very importantly, we should know where everyone is, especially if people are actively uh, engaged in political things, which is a legal thing to do anyway. Uh, let people know where they are. And once they don't go home this day, the time they say they'll go home, immediately uh, go around and uh, go to the military kind of police departments and find out. Visit prisoners would be very important. 
and do legal paralegal aid. You cannot just say human rights violations have existed. We need to know who did what, who was the victim, what was the person who per perpetrated the human rights violations name, if you know, description of the person, the time it happened, what actually happened, and if you have uh, wounds, you need to have a doctor uh, certify and write a statement that certain things happened to that person. Once you have those documents, you need uh, volunteers who are trained in paralegal writing records, and then send it to the lawyer who would work for free, work with many lawyers who would work for free, and doctors who would work for free. We were able to do that in the Philippines, uh, gather people who are for human rights in different professions, and then come up with records, and you can bring them to the United Nations one way or the other to the local uh, media as well, or publicize them on the web. And protection will include psychosocial, uh, mental, biological, the physical, and then the, the survivor, uh, of human rights violation also is not a person, it's a whole family. So the whole family needs uh, support as well. Okay? We're not looking only at one person. And there are many kinds of justice. The most common is we want to bring people before the court. It could be the International Criminal Tribunal, the local courts, but we see there's problem everywhere uh, with local courts, especially if we are minorities. But then second would be letting the perpetrator of human rights violation talk with the, the survivors. Uh, they did that in South Africa. There are videos you can watch on YouTube where the soldier, the police, who killed uh, the white uh, Afrikaner soldier, I'm sorry, police, I think, who tortured and killed a, a black South African, went to the house and asked for forgiveness from the mother, and the mother just slapped him and hit him and said, what you did is unexcusable. But there's, for some people, there's a need for face-to-face -face, uh, encounter between the perpetrator and the survivor or their family. And social justice, third would be, there's unequal distribution of wealth and property and land, and land being taken away and so on. And transitional justice will include what you have in Sri Lanka, but then again, uh, Amnesty International has said and Human Rights Watch, nothing had really happened. Even if you have the uh, uh, Reconciliation Commission coming out with certain recommendations. I've mentioned apology and forgiveness. It might work, it might not work, but some people need closure and to talk with one another. I think what you're doing here, you have the a history, memory, and justice. The memorial tree is very important. Uh, in fact, it has very uh, high impact and meaning to commemorate people who, who have died. And promotion would be including what we can do in the schools. If the school, for the children, if the teachers say, we have an international day, or we have a human rights day, or United Nations day, take that opportunity to showcase not only your culture, but your history. Do not forget people who have died. Make that part. And volunteer and say, we want to do something on that special day to commemorate our dead. So school is a very important area where we can uh, do this. And sometimes libraries are open-minded too. You can talk to the library and say, oh, we, we know, this is today is uh, Tamil Day, or today is what, holiday, holy, or Durga Puja, whatever. Maybe, oh yeah, there's a puja day today, can we do something? And, and by the way, it will include commemorating our dead. The Jews are very good in this. Holocaust, everyone knows Holocaust. They're very good, and rightly so. We have to learn from other communities. The Jews make everyone know what is Holocaust. Maybe we can do the same, and do that in our school. And for people in high school, college, Maybe can, they can go abroad, and even the people here, and exposure me to see what's going on, immersion is to live with people in the community. And then there are two ways we can show pictures. For some, like I think Europeans want to have nice pictures of talking of human rights. But in some countries, like in the Philippines, we want to show what actually happened, the real picture. Sometimes it can have a negative effect, 
people say, oh, that's too much. I don't want to see any of those pictures anymore. I don't want to do anything. So be careful with your audience. We, we in the Philippines, we want to show the faces of people. I have friends who have been killed, even now a bishop and a priest, who are fighting for human rights, for the poorest of the poor, for the farmers, and they're Christian, and the Christians also killed them. So as Kanta is saying, it has nothing to do sometimes with religion or ethnicity. They're just people who are uh, for human rights and those who are opposed to human rights. They're oppressors as well. And some people who want to go to the, uh, to, to the community, they can, in fact, up to now the Philippines, we do that. You can have open-minded Americans, European Americans, African Americans, want to know what's going on, say, by the way, do you want to go to the Philippines? We're organizing one trip in July. If you are a doctor, you can do medical mission. If you are a nurse or dentist, you can also do what you can do. But if you're religious, you can also learn to do justice from the religious point of view. So in that way, they see from the first time, they come back and they report, and they can go to media. And college students can do promote study abroad there. So many things you can do. Uh, again, use the school. It's a very important place. Learn from the Holocaust experience of the Jews. Uh, the Tamils should also be able to do that. Work with many different uh, religious groups. People who don't believe in God. Uh, the Buddhists, the Christian, the Hindu. Many interfaith groups are open to uh, the fight against discrimination. There are many possible openings. Uh, working with different therapy groups. Of course, what's fashionable now is Christian Muslim. But there's no stopping people from other religions to join the discussion. Okay? Uh, in there. But don't be afraid to speak truth to power. That's very important. Uh, in some places, they were able to use sanctions, boycott embargo, like South Africa and Chile. People will say, don't buy South African goods. Don't buy grapes or, or pears or peaches or wine from Chile. It worked. And even the same in Burma. Uh, they said don't buy anything made in Burma. Don't, don't uh, invest in Burma. So to the extent that they allowed Aung San Suu Kyi who was in house arrest forever to run for office and she won. She could have been the prime minister of Burma. She won the election in 1988 or so. But uh, government, military government decided she should not be the president, although she won in a democratic election and she was under house arrest. But now because of pressure, it worked. Well, there's still problems. There are a lot of problems, but it kind of worked. And working for human rights is an ongoing struggle. It never ends. Work locally, nationally, internationally. I, I was in tears when Skanta showed me the picture of the tree, and I, I always wanted to come and see the tree. I'm glad, uh, I'm deeply honored to be invited to come here, and I will finally be able to see the memorial tree. Never forget what had happened to your people, and may human rights violations never happen again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.